Um, first, tell me, how's President Trump doing so far? I'd give him about a B minus. Why a B minus? Because he has not done some things that he promised to do that he could have done very easily. My biggest reproach against Donald Trump is that he has not repealed the executive amnesties that he promised to repeal on his first day in office. That's something he could do without any kind of court interference, without any involvement of Congress, and he has failed to do so. That, to me, is his biggest black mark. Tell me what those executive amnesties are and what you were hoping he was going to achieve. The one that's best known is the DREAMers. It's called DACA. That's the acronym for it. And what it means is that people who were brought as children illegally into the United States have legal status. I don't think that they should be treated any differently from illegal immigrants, which is what they are. They are recipients of stolen goods, if you will. They did not come into the country under their own motivation, but they were brought here, and they are here illegally, and they should be treated as illegal immigrants. Obama decided that they should be treated as essentially legal residents, and he did this by executive order, which I think was unconstitutional. Donald Trump called it unconstitutional, and he could revoke that executive order simply by signing a piece of paper, and he promised to do that his first day in office. And that didn't happen. That didn't happen. And it doesn't look like it will happen. Let me ask you, in a, in a perfect world, in your mm. perfect world, yes. when Donald Trump became the candidate, and then obviously became the candidate, but when he became the Republican candidate, yes. what was your biggest hope? I supported Donald Trump because the effects of his policy would be to reduce the dispossession of whites. That is, to slow the process whereby whites become a minority in the United States. I never had any illusion that that was the reason for his policies, but that is the effect the policies would have had, expelling all illegal immigrants, taking a hard look at Muslim immigration and perhaps stopping it. Also, building a wall to prevent any further illegal immigration. He was going to look and attack, look at and attack birthright citizenship. I mean, most Americans just don't think it's right if a rich Chinese woman comes to the United States, has a baby, and is now the mother of a U.S. citizen. Or if a pregnant Mexican woman manages to get across the border and has a child for free on our dime in the United States and becomes the mother of a U.S. citizen. He promised to go after those things. He has done nothing about birthright citizenship, and he's waffling on the wall, which was his real signature issue when he was on the campaign trail. Unhappy with him? Disappointed? What are the feelings that you have about what's happened so far? I am disappointed in Donald Trump. Now, of course, he's vastly better than the alternative, which would have been Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton would have been beavering away, trying to legalize every single illegal immigrant, not just the ones who came over as minors. She would have been opening our doors to as many Muslims as possible, in increasing the number of Syrian refugees coming to the United States. She would have been welcoming Muslims uh, as wholeheartedly and as warmly as she possibly could. So there's a real difference. But Donald Trump could have done much better. And perhaps he will, but he is certainly falling down on the job, as far as I'm concerned, at this point. What is your vision for America when it comes to race? I don't want my children and my grandchildren to become a minority in the nation that their ancestors built. They are likely to become a despised and hated minority at the way people are being indoctrinated now to think that whites are responsible for everything that's ever gone wrong for non-whites anywhere in the world, any time in history. Just as in Israel, Israelis have a right to maintain a Jewish minority. In Japan, the Japanese have the right to maintain a Japanese majority. It's the same for Nigerians. It's the same for practically every non-white country. It's only France, for example. If the French wish to remain a majority, they're somehow hateful. Likewise, what is wrong with white Americans wanting their people, European stock, to remain a majority in the United States? We'd never voted to be dispossessed. We never voted to be swapped out and replaced by another people. This, to me, is a great injustice. But the answer to that is the Native Americans who never voted to have the whites come over. So I what agree. do you say to them? Because ultimately, they're brown people, right? The history of the United States is a terrible catastrophe for American Indians. No one would deny that. But if their dispossession was a catastrophe for them, why is our dispossession a good thing? It was a choice, right? 
coming over to this country was a, was a yes, choice. Yes, it was a choice for the American Indians initially as well. But yes, we came here. Now, of course, the American Indians were slaughtering each other. They were taking each other's territory. It's not as though they were pristine and pure in terms of... Right, so were the Europeans, though, to of be course. fair. They've yes. been at war yes. for a very long yes. time. That has been the way human beings have operated up until really the 19th century. And when European consciousness really dominated the world, we decided, well, that's not such a good thing. And we gave up our colonies in the 20th century. It is really European thinking that established this rule that you should not invade and take other people's countries. But what is happening in the United States today is a peaceful invasion, a non-military invasion, which white Americans have the power to stop, but have been psychologically disabled and are unable to say, no, sorry, this is a country that our ancestors built for us. And we wish you well, but you must flourish in your own countries. Whites are unable to say that, and, if, and unless they are able to retrieve that capacity, they will be essentially shoved aside by others who have a very vivid sense of their own demographic destiny and will reduce us to a minority. And the same thing is happening in all white countries at a greater or lesser rate. Why is that a bad thing? Do you wish to be displaced if you are a national majority? Why do, do you Japanese think you'd be displaced? Displaced? Yeah. At what point is it legitimate for whites to decry a policy that is making them a minority? When we're only 25% of the population? When we're 5%? When we're zero? Why is it wrong for whites to wish to remain a majority just as the Japanese wish to remain a majority in Japan? The Japanese know that their society will change in dramatic ways if they were to let in every Pakistani, every Iranian, every Filipino who wanted to come in, just as American society is changing. It's changing in ways that in their bones, whites do not care for, and that is why they move when the neighborhood turns Mexican or black or whatever it is. They dare not say so. And the United States is increasingly becoming a nation in which it's full of those neighborhoods where whites do not wish to live. Is this a good thing for them? It's not a good thing, but they have been browbeaten and terrorized to the point where they dare not express their deepest sentiments on this subject. Let, let me ask you about that, because expression obviously in this country is a, is a, is a right. Um, people are supposed to be able to express themselves freely. Yes. I want to ask you about your ideology. I mean, do you think that the ideology of, of a white country, a white supremacist, is something that's actually creating the problem of people of being all, unhappy with, with you and fearful of you? First of all, I completely reject the term white supremacy. White supremacy presumably means the idea that whites are to rule over people of other races. I have no wish to do that. I don't know anyone who wants to do that. I simply want the opportunity for my people, people of European origin, to be left alone so that we can pursue our own destiny. I you think don't we think that's happening need... already? You don't think that's no, happened? No. If we become a minority, our destiny will be taken out of our hands. The, the ideology of the United States today is Anybody can come. The United States is up for grabs. If it becomes a majority Hindu country, or a Muslim country, or an African country, who cares? Because anybody can become an American. If it becomes a majority Hindu, or Muslim, or African country, it will no longer be the nation that my ancestors built and had in mind to give to their children. Obviously, it's changing in ways that I consider to be in the detriment of my people and my culture, and we deserve a destiny just as we have a heritage. I want to ask you about young people. Certainly. Um, do you think college campuses, for example, should be integrated? I believe in complete freedom of association. If a private university wanted to have a campus, only for blacks or Asians or only for left-handed duck hunters, that should be their business. A government institution cannot discriminate in that manner. Private institutions, I believe, should absolutely have that right. But on college campuses today, there is a uniform view of whites, that whites are the devils of American and world history, that we are to blame for everything that's ever gone wrong, for non-white people, for women, for homosexuals, anywhere, anytime. This is a poisonous ideology, and this is why so many young whites who are part of our movement are hopping mad. I think that sometimes they express themselves in intemperate ways. 
But when you have been raised, right from kindergarten on, being told, you people are bad. You have no right to be proud of who you are. Once the scales fall from your eyes and you see the double standards that are operating, you have every reason to be hopping mad. When you say hopping mad, has that anger grown among white students, for example? Unquestionably it has grown. Why? Look at the, for the reasons that I just told you, because they're being told, and they're being told, every other group has the right to be proud of their heritage. The idea of whites taking pride in their heritage, this is considered white supremacy. That's the very word you used. This is considered to be an abomination, an immorality. Once they realize how suicidal this double standard is, they have every right to be angry. When it comes to um, the double standard, I, I will tell you, I never learned that all white people were devils and that they're the creation of everything bad and they've ruined everyone's life in school. Where, where are you getting that from? Oh, look at accounts of what are being, what's being told on campuses. Check your white privilege. They have special safe spaces for non-white people, dormitories, cultural centers so that they can be protected from the malevolent influence of whites, particularly white males. It's the rage on campuses now to have whiteness studies, and it's not a celebration of whiteness, believe me. It's an attempt to instill in whites a sense of guilt about who they are, so that they will become what are called allies in this process of destroying white supremacy, that they are part of an unfair, exploitative nation, an exploitative system, simply because of who they are. This is pervasive on college campuses. But on college campuses, what they argue is, there have look at the civil rights movement, look at the way that black people, for example, were treated. And the reason for this is so that they're protected, so they don't ever have to go through that again. Do you get protection by telling the people who built and established this country that they are uniquely evil and uniquely disqualified from any pride in their heritage? No. And more and more young whites are fed up with this, and they are absolutely right to be so. Do you condone what's been happening on campuses with people who are white and angry, putting up posters and putting up nooses, and do you agree that that's... Nooses, nooses, well, first of all, many of these cases of nooses or swastikas, they are either anonymous, we don't really know who they did them, but we also know that in many cases these are hoaxes. They are very tempting hoaxes for non-whites to do because of all of this uproar of sympathy, all of the coddling and all of the petting they receive if they can portray themselves as victims of these wicked white people. So the temptation is overwhelming. Many of these have been proven to be hoaxes. But you just but, said uh, that, mm. you know, people who are white are raging mad. They're angry about what they're seeing. But they are expressing themselves for the most part on the internet, not in any kind of direct way. They're putting they up posters. Express, and what do the posters say? Be proud to be white. The posters are innocuous. Don't feel guilty about being white. Is that a hateful expression? That just is a perfect example of the double standard. If Mexicans put up posters that said, be proud to be Chicano, or Asians said, be proud to be Asians, wonderful, good ethnic pride. When white people do it, oh boy, that's a perfect example of the double standard. I want to ask you about Donald Trump. Do you think that his election uh, to the office of the president, do you think that Donald Trump's election has inspired people who do want to see this country as a country that is dominated by the white race? I don't think that it has really inspired anybody. In fact, the fact that Donald Trump himself has been accused of white nationalism, white supremacy, all the names in the books, I think that has made people, if anything, a little bit more wary because they know that the media, all of these watchdog groups, are on the lookout for anything that could have the slightest whiff of white supremacy. I've been saying these things for 25 years and longer. Most people in our movement have been saying these things. The fact that Donald Trump is a better alternative to Hillary Clinton does not mean that the atmosphere has changed in any particular way to make it easier for me to say the things that I've been saying. There are numbers that dispute that, though. They have seen more people reporting incidents of hate crimes, for example. Oh, hate crimes. On campus. Many, many, many of these are hoaxes. Many of these have been prompted by 
uh, solicitations by the Southern Poverty Law Center. They came up with this huge list of alleged hate crimes. None of them verified. None of them even checked by the police. None of them even reported the police. This idea that there's some sort of raging wave of hate crimes on campuses around the country, if you look into the numbers in any detail, you'll find that this is probably fraudulent. And the most the most, the best publicized cases, an assault on a subway, for example, a woman who'd been knocked down, these things that became nationwide news, every one of them turned out to be a fraud. Every single one. The ones that became very well known, yes, they had to be retracted. Now, because there are cases where people have been prosecuted. There are certainly a few cases, but there have always been cases of that kind. Whether or not the election of Donald Trump has made them more frequent or not, I think that is a very debatable point. I know that the media love to have this idea that Donald Trump has unleashed the demons of American society. I don't see that at all. Our movement has been growing well before Donald Trump. And with Donald Trump or without Donald Trump, more and more whites are recognizing that they are being asked to do something that is ultimately suicidal. Whatever he says, whatever he does, whatever he does or does not say, that will not change. Our movement will grow because we have a correct understanding of history and human nature and what we're doing is absolutely morally irreproachable. Um, do you think that President Obama inspired people to join the movement, the white power movement? Not really. Uh, I would say something like Black Lives Matter. That has been much more of an impetus. Uh, let me correct you though. White power. You talk about white supremacy. White power. These are loaded terms. They make us sound like unhinged people. All we want is to be left alone. All we want is an opportunity to build our own communities that reflect our own nature. And we don't ask for anything special. We want black people, Asian people, Hispanic people. We want all of them to have an opportunity to build their own societies that reflect their particular nature. Nobody talks about black power anymore. That's obviously a militant movement. People talk about blacks being allowed to establish their own institutions if they wish, or to take part in institutions they want to take part in. And believe me, if people wish to mix it up and have all sorts of different neighbors of different races, fine. I'm perfectly happy for them to do so. Most people don't. And all I'm asking for is an opportunity for us to be left alone. Don't you have that opportunity? How are you not no. left alone? How am I not left alone? The U.S. Justice Department, under Obama and under every other president up to him, has been very diligent about trying to integrate neighborhoods. They want Section 8 houses here. They want integrated schools there. In the work floor, in the workforce, even if you're a private, private employer, you can't have an all-Asian workforce if you want to. The United States government has been very, very diligent in trying to get people to mix together. What the government should do is recognize that most people prefer not to mix. And if they prefer not to mix, that is a perfectly legitimate and moral moral choice, and they should not be prosecuted or persecuted for that. So you're talking about all-white schools, you're okay with all-white neighborhoods, all-white businesses. If they wish to be, if they wish to be all-white, they should have that opportunity. But that's how you want to live, correct? That is my preference, it is certainly majority white. I'm not talking about any kind of 100% purity, but this reflects the desires of the vast majority of whites, whether they will admit it or not. We are all supposed to be celebrating diversity, but look at the way white people and non-white people live. Do all the, non all the white people you know, do they have, uh, they have a multicultural experience day in, day out? No. They prefer to live in white communities. Churches, American churches, are a perfect example. 95% of the congregations are at least 85% one race, and many are 100% one race. Why is that? It's because no one has been trying. The government has not been fining churches that are not mixed. And when people are completely free to choose, they prefer to worship with people who are like themselves. There is nothing wrong with this. This is a natural human state, and we should build a society on a correct understanding of human nature rather than on some fantasy about what others would like us to be. I'm going to push back a little bit. Certainly. Some people might say, you're living in a fantasy because there is no way that this country is going to have an all-white society. It's just not well, happening. 
Uh, you may say so, and that may be true, but I still have a duty to my ancestors who had a conception of America and an obligation to my children who I think would be happier in the kind of America I envisage to at least have some portion of the United States where we can be us. Only we can be us, and we have the right to be us. Even if that's just in a small part of the United States, I do not believe that my civilization, my people will survive if we continue to import everyone from all around the world and this idea that America is up for grabs, that people who are going to grab it are not going to the people who will carry my culture and my institutions and my people forward in any meaningful way. How would that work? I mean, where would black people go? For oh, example. black people could be in a, in a place that, where they could affirm their identities. I think that it's not impossible that the United States could end up having enclaves that were recognizably white or Asian or Hispanic. I'm not sure what the future will be, but if the future continues to be a prolongation of the present, if the future of the United States is South Central Los Angeles, or if it's Detroit or Newark, then there is no future for my people. When it comes to, when you talk about your people, do you want to live in a society that is not integrated at all? That is the preference of most people, and that's what, that's what makes most people happier. If you have, How do you say that? Because look at the way they behave. What is white flight but an expression of that very phenomenon? What is the fact that you have suburbs of Atlanta and Washington, D.C., where you have very well-off middle-class blacks who prefer to live among other blacks? They could buy a house in this neighborhood. This neighborhood is largely white. If you've got the money, you can certainly move here. But most black people who have the money to live in a nice neighborhood, they would prefer to live in a black suburb. And God bless them. This is natural and normal. I don't know anyone like that, just so you know. I know well, nobody like that. The go to neighborhoods Atlanta. I live in are integrated. Well, go to Atlanta. Go to Prince George's County. Most integrated neighborhoods, most integrated neighborhoods in the United States are probably transitioning from one race to another. You have many, in, many neighborhoods in California, for example, in which blacks had been living, Hispanics have come in, and blacks no longer feel comfortable, and they're moving out. But that's they partly because it. of gentrification. There's, a, there's an affordability issue that, that happens as well. Oh, so there's well. lots of reasons. If you are living in an area, if you're living in a black area and you have many, many Mexicans come in, it's not as though all of a sudden the rents are going to go skyrocketing. No. It's a question of oil and water. There have been many black activists who've complained about this. We just can't mix with these people. They don't like it when whites come in. They don't like it when Asians come in. They don't like it when Mexicans come in because they have a certain texture of their neighborhood that they prefer that reflects their unique sensibilities. And that's as it should be. Do you agree with the term hate crime? Some of these things that we talked about before mm. happening. Do you I've, see things like some of the things, for example, happening on campuses? Do you see those as hate crimes? First of all, give me a good, concrete, verified example of what you would call a hate crime on a campus. So recently in Washington, mm. someone threw a rotten banana at a black student, and there are bananas that have been put all over the campus okay. um, that seem to be signaling the first African-American no. president of the student body. Mm. Uh, would you consider this, should this be a crime? Or is this I'm an expression you. of, I don't consider it a crime. I consider it very rude. I wouldn't condone that kind of activity, but it's obviously not a crime. Whereas you can probably get expelled for doing that. If you were to say, on the other hand, if you were to teach a course in which you explained that all whites are racist and only whites can be racist, that would be just fine. I think that's wrong. That's another expression of freedom of speech. But I think that is just as damaging as throwing a rotten banana at somebody. What would you consider hate crime? I mean, are you worried that this country is getting more and more and more polarized? It's inevitable that the United States become more polarized because the whole project of multiracialism is doomed to produce polarization. Multiracialism has worked to the extent that it has because whites have been basically lulled to sleep. Many whites have been told, oh, celebrate diversity. 
even if diversity means your dwindling numbers and dwindling influence. Many whites have gone along with this. More and more they are realizing that celebrating diversity means that their culture is being displaced, their people are being displaced, and they are realizing that this is the road to nowhere. So what is happening in the United States today is increasingly what is inevitable whenever you try to get people of different races to mix. There is no peaceful, happy, kumbaya, multiracial nation anywhere. It has worked as well as it has here because we are a rich country and because whites have essentially dismantled any sense of their own legitimate interests. As they reconstruct a sense of their legitimate interests, yes, there will be tensions, but without those tensions, my people are doomed to oblivion. When it comes to teaching some of these ideas, I mean, are you okay with your ideas or groups like yours going and recruiting on college campuses, trying to... Of course, why not? Why not? Any, any group, any group wants its ideology to proliferate. What is wrong with people who believe what I believe, and as I, get, as I said, I believe we are entirely in conformity with history and human nature. What we do is morally irreproachable. Why should we not seek more adherence? When it comes to more adherence, you talked about people getting more and more agitated, um, particularly white people getting very agitated with what's happening in the yes. country. Yes. Um, do you think recruitment is going well? Yes. When yes. it comes to young people? Oh, yes, 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 unlike ever before. I've been involved in this for more than 25 years, and I am constantly impressed by the number of young people who are completely wide awake on the subject of race, who are not bamboozled and intimidated by all of this nonsense of diversity being our strength. Diversity is a weakness. Diversity is a source of tension. And the whole idea that whites are those who have caused harm after harm, damage after damage to everybody else in the world, they're sick and tired of that, and rightly so. The number of young whites who are waking up to racial reality is unprecedented. Why do you think that is? Why now? Why now? Because it is much, much easier for a young white person to find an alternative point of view. <clears throat> it is happening now because it's much easier for a young white person to find an alternative point of view. All they need to do is find an internet site just a few clicks away that explains in very clear terms what they may have been feeling in an inchoate way but has never been expressed clearly for them. The internet has changed everything. It's made it possible for our ideas to have an impact, to be disseminated in ways that make it inevitable that more people will find them, and because they are so attractive, because our ideas are in conformity with reality, once people find them, they have a very hard time going back to the delusions of liberal orthodoxy. And you don't think it has anything to do with the new administration? Oh, it was happening well before the new administration. As I said... Have they helped in any way? Oh, the, the Donald Trump presidency, as an alternative to a Hillary Clinton presidency, did suggest that at the political level, the United States might change in encouraging ways. Yes, that was a very encouraging thing. The betterment of white people. Oh, to, dis to slow this process of our dispossession which is all I'm asking, slow this down. I don't want to be a minority. And the fact that we had a president who was implementing policies that would slow this process, indeed, that was encouraging. And the fact that he was elected, that too was encouraging. But the rise in the number of whites who see race in intelligent, undeceived terms, that was growing well before Donald Trump ever came along. That being said, black people also feel like their wokeness, mm -hmm. their awakening, it's also happening now. Right, right. And that's why you have this Black Lives Matter movement. Black Lives Matter has been built on what is to me and what is to a majority of whites, a completely delusional understanding of what happened in the Trayvon Martin case, for example, the Freddie Gray case, the Michael Brown case. All of these instances, when you look at the details, and the government, even under Barack Obama and Eric Holder, found that in all of these cases there was essentially legitimate self-defense. Black people refuse to understand that. They insist that white policemen are basically cruising around the country looking for black people to kill. 
this is nonsense. The huge majority of whites understand that this is nonsense. And if 50 years, 60 years after the Civil Rights Movement, black people are still rioting, what this says to white people is this whole multiracial experiment has failed. We need something new, and we offer something new. There are cases, for example, what about an officer shooting someone in the back? Oh, occasionally these things do happen, and that person, I'm sure that officer, will be sent to jail for a very long time, as he should be. So do you think only black people are ever shot in the back? There are many white people, unarmed white people, who are shot by police. Maybe they were threatening, maybe they were not. Nobody cares about that. It is only when the victim is black, when the perpetrator is white, that there's a huge national stir about this. If a black officer shoots a black criminal, nobody's interested. It is all so racially polarized, so racially biased in terms of the reporting, that inevitably whites realize that this is a game that is rigged against them, and they have had enough of it. Are you angry with what you've seen and how the country is if, going? If I were to be angry, I would be angry against white people, white people who have let this happen, white people who have changed our immigration policies to let in the whole world, elite white people whose lives are not the least bit damaged by the change in the composition of our neighborhoods, of our public schools, white people who don't send their children to schools where you have to have 15 interpreters at the PTA meeting white people who don't live in neighborhoods where you can't play baseball on the baseball diamonds because the Mexicans are playing soccer, white people whose lives are utterly unaffected by the diversity they claim to celebrate. It appears no. your life is unaffected by that. And how many people can afford to live in a neighborhood like this? That is exactly the point. All of these elite white people who claim that they favor multi this, multi that, and who live in their private enclaves that are overwhelmingly white. Where did the Clintons move to after they left the White House? Chappaqua, New York. The great champions of diversity live in about as white a place as you can possibly find this side of Iceland. And black these people would call that white privilege. Uh, well, it's a privilege, yes, to live in, the, in a kind of neighborhood that white people, because they build attractive neighborhoods, have built. My point is that whites should not have the privilege of living in the kind of society their ancestors built. They deserve that privilege. What I'm saying is the people, the white people, who are most enthusiastic about promoting diversity for the, the poor slobs who live in trailer parks, they don't. Forgive me. Okay, that's good. What, I, what I'm saying is that the elite whites, who never suffer from the effects of diversity themselves, are saying, oh, it's so wonderful, when it affects those who cannot escape from it as they escape from it. Those people are contemptible hypocrites. If I were in the business of hating anybody, those are the people that I would hate. Speaking of hypocrites, is yes. Donald Trump a hypocrite? I can't claim to know Donald Trump's mind. And I never believed that he promoted these policies that would slow white dispossession because he cared about white dispossession. So I don't know whether he's a hypocrite or not. I would have to know what he really thinks about things. He is certainly breaking some of his campaign promises, but virtually every politician does that. He's got more than three more years. Maybe he will build the wall. Maybe he will repeal these amnesties. We'll see. But uh, so far, he has not been doing what he promised he would do. Some of the things which he promised he would do on the very first day. Tell me what your dream for America is. My dream for America is a nation in which every group has the right to express its own preferences, have its own institutions, perhaps even its own part of the country where they can be genuinely who they are. That is my dream for America. So completely segregated if that is what they wish. If there are people who wish to be integrated, by all means, let them integrate. But for those who wish to be with people like themselves, just as so many church congregations are overwhelmingly one race, one language, one nationality, let people separate if that's what they wish. What is wrong with that? How do you respond to people that say, you're a hate monger? I would say, how do you claim to read my mind? All I'm saying is, I want a chance for my people to survive and prosper. What is hateful about that? Is it hateful for Nigerians? 
to wish for their country to remain Nigerian, or Egyptians to remain Egyptian. Again, Israel has the right to remain Jewish. Is that because Jews hate everybody else in the world? No. They want their people and their culture to survive. That's all I want. To call me a hate monger, this is utter nonsense, and it's an attempt to say, don't pay attention to this guy. He's unhinged. He's motivated by passion or irrationality, whereas all I want is the survival of my people. There is history that says that your people survived and thrived on the backs of slaves in this country. Do you think country. we invented slavery? Do you think of course not, but you certainly not. profited from it. We abolished slavery. We had to go to the Africans and say, cut this stuff out. There are many places that still practice slavery. Do you think really the wealth of the United States depended on slaves? Canada is just as wealthy as the United States. New Zealand is just as wealthy as the United States. I do These think places, the history shows that the United States depended on slavery. They helped no. build the White House. The slaves in the South kept the South poor. If slavery was such a wonderful, productive thing, why was the South not the richest part of the country? It held back industrialization. The myth that somehow the wealth of the United States depends on slavery, that is yet again a calumny again. It's like another attempt to make white people feel bad. And if blacks are such a uniquely productive, enterprising, hardworking group, why is it that black plate, black that black countries and black places aren't the most wealthy in the world. There is no way this idea holds water at all. You don't think black slaves had anything to do with the building of this country? Of course they did. They were told by whites, do this, do that, and they did it. Right, and they were paid labor, for that. Irish laborers would have done it, and Irish laborers... Not for free. Irish laborers would not have had to be raised from childhood. They would not have had to be kept in old age. In fact, there were many northern analysts who came down to the south and said, "This, you've got a completely inefficient system here. Get rid of these black slaves. Hire Irish navvies. Hire them when you need them. Fire them when you don't. Right, but the hiring idea, them requires you to pay them. And okay. that is how people make money. They didn't have to pay the labor. No. Right? The, the idea that slavery was some uniquely productive system is completely wrong. Anyone who has analyzed the economics of slavery understands perfectly well that slavery held the South back. Would you not agree that the southern parts of the United States, certainly up until the Second World War, maybe in the 50s and 60s, were the poorest part of the, war, part, poorest part of the country? Why is that if slaves are so productive? Apparently, the slave owners were bad businessmen. <laughs> they were bad businessmen because they had this idea that slavery was a great thing. They and they were trying to hold on off. to it. It's free labor. Yes. Right. Well, free labor, it's not free. It's not free when you have to maintain old slaves in old age, raise them from infancy. It is not a productive system. Again, look at the external evidence. If slavery was so productive, the South was poor. If slavery was an absolutely essential uh, motor for American development, why isn't Canada poor? Why isn't Scandinavia poor? No. All of these countries are wealthy because they were built by whites with the particular qualities that whites bring with them wherever they go. The presence or absence of slavery in the southern part of the United States was, if anything, incidental and probably held development back. Is there anything else you'd like to add to the conversation? Let me think. <laughs> I would like to emphasize, I would like to emphasize that what I want is nothing special for white people. I want white people to have the chance to develop their own society, their own institutions, without being embraced by large numbers of people who are unlike themselves and who will change their society. People who are and black, brown, yes, Jewish, People who are not religions. of European origin. Though it is obvious that Europeans will assimilate most easily in the United States. And I would say this about Donald Trump. He at least recognizes, unlike Hillary Clinton, that the United States is a distinct people. Now. He also recognizes that some people don't fit in as well as others. He has tumbled to the rather obvious conclusion that Muslims don't fit in quite as well as certain people. Now, would he have the courage or insight to say that being white is an important part of being an American? I suspect he would not. But at least, unlike Hillary Clinton, he doesn't think that he wants a world that's utterly borderless. He doesn't think, like Hillary Clinton does, that the American identity is an intellectual invention. He recognizes that there is such a thing as an American people with distinctive interests, and he wants to protect those interests. He has a sort of a vague, clumsy idea of what constitutes Americanness, 
But my point, to return to my previous point, is that I don't want anything for whites that I'm not happy to grant to every other group. Okay, I think we're, we're done. You talk about biology, and I just said to you, I'm a mixed race person. What do you think of me? How are, how are we different? Me as a mixed race person, you as a person who happens to be Caucasian. The idea that races are identical and interchangeable is a just complete fallacy. Aren't we all human? Of course we're humans, but all dogs are dogs. But they're not interchangeable and identical either. They're the same species, we are the same species, but we are different subspecies. And the different races of humanity have evolved separately for, in some cases, a hundred thousand years. We have developed different physical capacities. We have, different, we have developed different average levels of intelligence. We have developed different average temperaments, if you will. These things have been very carefully studied, and people absolutely hate to talk about them, but it is part of our natural evolution. It's part of our biology. It is, is it your contention from looking at these studies that black people are less intelligent than white people? Black people, on average, are less intelligent than white people. That does not mean they're not some very intelligent black people are smarter than most white people. But by the same evidence, it's very clear that East Asians, on average, are more intelligent than white people. We're not the smartest race. We're not the most law-abiding race. We're not the race that has the fewest number of illegitimate children. All of those prizes go to the East Asians. It doesn't mean that I want to be replaced by East Asians, though. In some respects, objectively, you could describe East Asians as superior to Caucasians. But I am white. I have a loyalty to my people, just as I have a loyalty to my own children. The feelings are very similar. I feel about whites the way I feel about my own children as opposed to other people's children. I don't dislike other people's children. In fact, I can be very fond of other people's children. But you don't want to live with them. Well, I might, but I will make sacrifices for my own children that I wouldn't for anybody else's children. And that's a perfectly natural thing. And our race is our largest extended family. That's the group to which we feel a kind of instinctive loyalty. And it is perfectly normal for us to think that this is the group that is our primary family, but it implies no hostility to anyone else's family, just as my preference for my children implies no hostility towards my neighbor's children, of whom I may be very fond. Speaking of your children, do you think that an all-white university should exist? If there is a demand for it, and if there is, it's a private university, by all means, just like an all-black university should it exist for people who want to go to an all-black university. As you know, on many college campuses, black students are demanding blacks-only dormitories, blacks-only social centers, safe spaces. God bless them. If that's what makes them happy, that is what they should have. But don't reserve that sort of thing just for them. We should all have that opportunity. A whites-only university. White yes. only spaces. Yes, exactly right. Exa What's wrong with that? You could argue that you're discriminating against other we people. We discriminate in, with every breath we take. When you turn right rather than turn left, you're discriminating. If you have steak rather than rice, you're discriminating. But you're not hurting right. anyone doing that, right? If I refuse to associate with someone, that person is no worse off than he was before. His feelings may be hurt. If I want to ask a beautiful girl out on a date, she has the right to discriminate, and she should exercise that right. Am I, have, I been, have I been hurt? Maybe my feelings are hurt, but I'm no worse off than I was before. But Discrimination guess, is essential to the way we live our lives. But there is the argument and, and that is borne out in history, the industrialization, sort of the discrimination that is an entire system did hurt people. Didn't allow, for example, African Americans to have new books, be in schools that were as good as the white schools. <clears throat> that, I believe, was an inevitable and deeply unfortunate consequence of trying to build a multiracial society. I was always opposed to laws that restricted blacks in any particular way. I believe in complete freedom of association. So laws that said blacks have to be there, I disapprove of that. I think those laws were wrong. But then when those laws were abolished, then we went without taking a breath to the idea, okay, blacks don't have to be there. We want to sprinkle them around wherever the whites are. No, so long as voluntarily people choose to associate with their preferred associates, 
That I approve of. Okay. What do you think about, this just came up in my head, mm -hmm. what do you think about the Ku Klux Klan? Well, I don't know much about the Ku Klux Klan, but anyone who promotes violence or illegality, I completely oppose. You're okay, though, with their other ideologies. I don't know what their ideologies are. Uh, if, that whites uh, are far superior to blacks. Well, I mean, you just said that whites are smarter or more in intelligent than blacks, right? On average, whites are more intelligent than blacks. And really, to deny this is to just deny mountains of scientific evidence. Some people now, call that it? junk science. They have not looked into it. There is an enormous amount of extremely reliable science. It goes back a hundred years, and it keeps being reaffirmed over and over and over. And I can promise you, when the, time, when the day comes when we find the genetic combinations that code for intelligence, they will not be found to be equally distributed among all human groups. I would bet the next 12 mortgage payments that that's the case. That now, whites are far not more... Far, well, Look, and again, you see, everyone harps on this idea of being whites as opposed to blacks. East Asians, again, they are more intelligent than whites. It's just the way our different groups evolved, and we should reconcile ourselves to this. And I'll tell you something else. It's very important to recognize these differences because if we are constantly saying to black people, yes, you are just as hardworking, you are just as smart as white people. Because they the, are. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Well, hold on. <laughs> hold on. If they are, then the logical consequence is you are more likely to be in jail, you're more likely to be poor, you're more likely to have a small net worth for one reason only, because of those wicked white people over there. Isn't that the best possible way to teach black people to hate white people? Might work. Yes, it works very well. It works very well. Now, on the other hand, if we recognize the truth, and if we recognize that black people are not on average as intelligent, and they are not going to achieve at the same level as whites. But let them go as high as they wish, as high as they can. I'm all for that. All the way Just to the go, White House. All the way to the White House. But don't expect equal outcomes. As you well know, the Ivy League is full of Asians now because they are smarter and harder working than my people. But nobody says, whoa, this is horrible, we're being discriminated against. Because deep in their bones, White people at universities recognize that Asians, if you go to a class and it's full of Asians, they'll drop out. They go, oh, I don't want to compete with these guys. They know they're going to do better. They have a sneaking suspicion they're probably smarter. We don't so make a this, big deal you don't think this. this is nurture versus nature? No, no. You think it's nature? Good cultures don't just drop from the sky, and the lucky people get the good ones. In fact, there has been there's a very important study called the Minnesota Transracial Adoption Study, in which they took black Infants that were given up for adoption, raised in middle-class white families, the idea being, okay, if it's all nurture, then by the time they're 16, 18 or something, they'll be performing at exactly the white level. In the early years, there was an effect. IQ for young children is malleable by environment. By the time they're 16 or 18, they were operating at almost exactly the average level for blacks in Minnesota. No. It is nature. Nature is a powerful, powerful thing. And you find this in all sorts of adoption studies. Identical twins given up for adoption, reared in completely separate households. They are almost identical people, despite how different their nurturing environments were. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay.